you. This is a dream come true for me. This is genuinely, I love this part of the world and to get to interview you in my favorite part of the world is kind of about as good as it gets. So thank you so much for agreeing to do this. My pleasure, lovely to hang out with you. <laughs> you are one of the most intelligent and prolific women I know and have had the pleasure to meet. You've written 20 books on feminism. Well, no, I've written 24, 25 books, but many of them are not about feminism. Yes. All of them are secretly feminist, and some of them are overtly <laughs> feminist, I would say. That makes sense. Yes. What drives you to write so prolifically? I successfully avoided husbands and children and day jobs. <laughs> and that... Those things can all really interfere with your productivity. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. And, I, and I'm always fascinated by... I find if I have anything to write, I procrastinate magnificently. Do you have a rigorous writing schedule whereby you write between this hour and this hour and you meet this very specific thing? And is there a routine that kind of helps you get so much done? I get up every morning and have tea with milk on an octagonal tray I bought at a thrift store many years ago. <laughs> And like that has to happen fairly early. And then the rest of it is kind of a muddle and a blur. And I often feel like the most distracted, disorganized person ever. But books do issue forth regularly, which makes me think, like, if I'm this disorganized, what's everybody else doing? <laughs> and uh, so, but, you know, I really wanted to be a writer. I loved books, and writing was like one way even more than reading to be with books, in books, about books. And so, when I learned how to read, I just decided I was going to write books, and which is a very easy decision until you actually have to do it, but somehow one thing led to another. In your bio, you cite that you're a product of the California public school system from kindergarten to graduate school. How did that shape you? Why did you want to mention it and in that way? It was actually very funny. I was on a panel with two men just up the road in Monterey about 10 years ago, and they both name dropped, the, dropped their Ivy League universities. And I was like, you're older than me. We don't drop name drop our university out here. And then I was like, that's what an Ivy League education is for, apparently. <laughs> and I was like, well, you know, can I say bad words on this? Yes, I and think so. I was so. like, well, fuck it. If they're going to name drop, <laughs> you know, the Ivy Leagues, I'm going to name drop public education in California. Yeah. So, yes! You know, and that's so cool. I sometimes worry that somebody will say, like, well, we should defund that because it produced her. But, um, <laughs> you know, but I just realized, like, we have, you know, we got to name drop these things. That's amazing. So, yeah. I love that you did that so incredibly specifically. Was there one specific moment or a series of moments that led up to you knowing that you wanted to be a writer? I wanted to be a ballerina, and then I learned how to write, how to read, which apparently happened very rapidly in first grade. My mom says the first week. And then I thought I wanted to be a librarian because they are with books all day, and what could be lovelier than that? Until I realized that somebody wrote all those books. And books for me, they're like, you know, it's like a magic box. Until you, until you can read them, you can open it, but you can't actually see what's inside or do anything with what's inside. So. Just that act of learning how to read led pretty quickly to my third and final career decision, which I stuck with. <laughs> That's amazing. So, you so know, from a very as I said, age. it's very easy to decide to do something. Actually, do it is a whole other thing. And it must have been like that with you deciding to be an actress, and then you had to act. I yeah. Well, I. It did happen fast. It yes, it certainly did. I mean, I. It, it kind of came out of nowhere, to be honest. It was it was actually poems and poetry that really got me. And I was also on a debating team, because I was really nerdy like that. That was sort of what got me into it. But um, I this feels like a, this, it must be a calling for you. I mean, you, you've truly, truly dedicated your life to, to doing this. And I love that sometimes I email you and I get the, an out of office kind of, in order to get anything done, I cannot respond to, to emails and I just love that you kind of create that. Um, I try. Yeah, you create but quiet space But the really nice people listen to those things, and the less nice people continue to chase you around. Mm -hmm. you, really? As you, as you wow. know, as you know. Yeah. It's, but it's a really interesting thing that 
nobody calls you up, nobody emails you desperately, urgently urging you to do the work most central to your life and your vision and yourself. Everybody wants you to do something other than that. And a lot of, some of it's noble causes and some of it's favors for deserving friends and some of it, you know, and I believe mm -hmm. in service and support of the community. But, uh, you know, it, if, if I couldn't possibly do everything I'm asked to do, and if I did half of it, I would never write another book. So there's this I love that. interesting thing. I think if I'd been popular as a young woman, mm -hmm. I would have had a much easier time with people wanting things from me. But, <laughs> you know, I was like hiding in, in libraries and reading a book a day, so. Wow. I love that, the work most central to your vision. That's yeah. such a beautiful way of, um, of putting it, uh, which makes sense because you're a beautiful writer, so <laughs> that makes sense. In whose story is this, Old Complex New Chapters, you uh, talk so brilliantly about how power determines who gets to tell their story and who gets to be believed. Are there stories or people that you really wish we were hearing more of right now beyond those that you cite in your book? I think everybody in this room, everybody listening to this recognizes that women, people of color, non-straight, non-cisgender people have not been sufficiently allowed to take center stage to tell the story, to determine what matters, to set the priorities. And that's changing in some ways. But something I always feel, and I write about in the introduction to this book, before we get all like they were they were a disaster but now we're awesome and we're so, we're so damn woke is i feel like <laughs> in next year <laughs> next decade next century we'll be like oh my god those people in the year 2019 so completely missed this and now we see now we include this thing we excluded so i feel there are things we don't see yet and we always have to recognize how finite our vision is and how much more is out there and um, you know there are other things coming along and we have to be grateful to the people who woke us up and who taught us to see these other things as I've been taught so much by indigenous activists black lives matter feminism and you know a life blessedly spent among the gay men of San Francisco and you know etc and the drag queens so Amazing. and the dykes and have there been moments, are there things that you've written that you look back on and you, that you feel, gosh, I, you know, I was, I had a blind spot here and I, or, you know, are there things that you would, you feel you wish that retroactively or in retrospect you could go back and add more context to? And it's interesting because there are a bunch of things, in, including my first book, which was about the visual artists who are part of beat culture, where I feel like, I kind of surfed a specific layer of the culture and you go deeper, you know, I didn't have the equipment to go after the massive misogyny of that era, although some of it, as I was talking to people of that generation, was being targeted at me. The memoir I have coming out that's in your lap, you know, takes care of the beats very thoroughly, as people will presently see. So you revisited. Oh, yeah. So I feel like there were things I understood better <clears throat> and that were clearer. You know, and I don't feel like any of those things is a misrepresentation, but it often feels like I both have space to say things I might not have earlier, and that it's really kind of when you tell a story, you decide which layer you're going, and that I've been spending a lot of time the last decade on the feminist layers, the gender politics and things, which I was gentler about in some of those earlier books. Interesting. Of those 20 books that I, I are part of this, anthology is there is there one particular one that stands out to you as the one that you're the most proud of or that you feel if you know oh, Emma, impossible it's like choosing I children. children I, 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 I know I know it's and it's really and they, they did different things like my book hope in the dark I wrote in the bleak era after the bombing in Iraq started and it was written to encourage people a word a writer friend of mine reminded me doesn't mean to you know pet people on the head it means literally to instill courage and uh, you know and it played a role in people's own political lives that was really important to me my book a field guide to getting lost is a much more introspective personal book that has also been meaningful to people and a lot of artists have made art in response to it and stuff so there's that then um, 
you know, I love the swath, men explain things has cut through the universe. And, um, you know, and right now the book I'm writing after the memoir uh, uh, comes out, that I'm working on now, that'll be out probably in, possibly in 2021, maybe in 2022, I'm just like madly in love with. But they all have a function and they all represented something. I, all of them are something I really wanted to say and I really wanted people to think about. So there's a, there's a couple that I think didn't turn out great, but there's a lot, you know. I, I strongly disagree, but. Uh, you just haven't I, read those ones yet. <laughs> okay. Mm. Uh, I chose Whose Story Is This? Old Conflicts, New Chapters as the book for my book club, Our Shed Shelf, along with your take on Cinderella. The bit that I loved so much, well, you I mean you talk about this across your work, really. You quote George Orwell uh, in The Prevention of Literature where he writes, totalitarianism demands, in fact, the continuous alteration of the past and in the long run probably demands a disbelief in the very existence of truth. It seems that we've crossed over into this truthless world that Orwell foretold. Do you see a way back? I don't know where we go from here, but I have to say that Orwell's sentence could have described the impeachment hearings this morning for those of you who are listening to them. There was actually a moment where one of those Republicans, and there's a, there's a great old saying like, if the facts are on your side, argue the facts. If the law is on your side, argue the law. And if the facts and the law aren't on your side, pound the table with a shoe. <laughs> and this Republican said indignantly, are you saying the president is lying? Which is kind of like saying, are you saying water is wet? Which mm. it generally is. And, um, you know, and it was really interesting seeing how they're able to use the conventionalities where you can't say he's the biggest goddamn liar, you know, ever to. So, but it w it's interesting that they've basically, the, their defense of Trump is based on the ability to make inconvenient facts go away and to write any story they want and to really kind of mm. divorce themselves from the you know, enlightenment project mm. of kind of science and fact and evidence-based yeah. reality. I feel like it's a huge struggle. I don't, I don't prophesy much. I don't know where we go from here, but I feel as a writer who is trained as a journalist, but that, you know, as a storyteller, constantly adhering to the accuracy and precision and factuality as values is really important. And also something that all of us do in our lives. Do we share a story that we haven't verified? Do, you know, do we repeat unsubstantiated stuff? Do we check stuff out? Mm. Do we know, you know beyond the kind of sound bite who the candidates are we're supposed to vote for? Mm. And there's a, there's a quality of thoughtfulness. I don't know where we go from here. My happiest times, I think that social media and you know, personal devices, smartphones, are to our generation, are to our era what crack was to the 1980s, something where the next, that totally caught up a generation that had no kind of preparation for it, no immunities, and that a later generation will be like, you know, doesn't, you know, I don't want to go there, I don't need to do this, there's some other way to be, there's some, you know, some things I'm not going to let go of. Mm -hmm. That's but the fact that Silicon Valley, because like you look at these terrible things happening around the world, uh, why are the rainforests burning in Brazil? Because Bolsonaro is president. Why is Bolsonaro president? Well, YouTube did a huge amount to prevent, to, you know, aid his rise to power. What is the role of Facebook and the Rwanda mm. and the genocide, the Rohingya genocide in Burma? What is there's, um, you know, YouTube is now playing Hindu nationalist videos that are helping this anti-Muslim sentiment. You look at so much of this stuff, and it is coming from a place that you really used to be proud of being from, the San Francisco Bay Area, which is now Silicon Valley. And it's an absolute nightmare what they've created. And, you know, for example, Mark Zuckerberg's decision that Donald Trump can run bald-faced lies, which, because they're political advertisements, they'll leave alone. So I don't know where we go from here. I'm very excited Elizabeth Warren wants to break up the monopolies that are Google and Facebook and Apple and Amazon and kind of like take a little something back from the oversized billionaires. But I don't know what else we do. The bigger project is cultural. 
where do we get our information? How do we communicate? Who do we believe? Mm. How do we learn to sort data as data comes mm. at us faster and harder mm. and weirder than before? I love how you said gaslighting is a collective cultural phenomenon yeah. and that being accurate even in our personal encounters and conversations consistently is, is resistance that matters. And you speak so beautifully as well about lies being kind of aggressions. Yeah, well, I have that essay called They Think They Can Bully the Truth, where I realized what Brett Kavanaugh, the, now our Supreme Court Justice, Trump, and so many of these men, these Me Too men, have in common is that they assume they were so powerful they could insist on versions of reality that were convenient for them mm. that weren't necessarily based on what had actually happened. You see so many of these men who assumed they could do whatever they wanted to a woman or a child and then just insist it didn't happen, you shouldn't listen to that other person, and who prevailed over and over and over mm. until something shifted. And not enough, I'm not saying like everything's great now, but something profound has shifted. I saw it shift in the 1980s. You know, we've had these moments where something cracked open. But we do suffer, and I think this is a democracy problem. In a culture where everyone is valued equally, your version is not more valuable than mine. We don't have a culture in which one category of people are routinely believed and one category are routinely disbelieved, which means that we don't have a culture in which officially we're against rape, but we overlook it all the time because men say they didn't do it. So I feel that, you know, at all times, that, that democracy part of it is huge. How do we, whose story is this? How do we create a world in which everyone gets to tell their own story, in which people have equal audibility? And so a kind of democracy of stories in which everyone gets heard, I think is a lot of what the project of feminism, the project of anti-racism, the projects of intersectionality and inclusion, the projects of getting over heteronormative everything mm -hmm. are about. And it is a democratic project and it is mm -hmm. a storytelling project. You uh, mentioned mm -hmm. Brett Kavanaugh in your essay. Did you ever think that 28 years after Anita Hill that we would sort of see history repeat itself in a similar situation to that again? I the Anita, Anita Hill achieved, because often people are like, oh, she lost. And I, for the first thing I want to say, I have, I'm so grateful to her. I have so much respect for her. She changed the country. She created a space for thousands upon thousands of stories about workplace sexual harassment to appear. Actual legislation on sexual harassment was passed in 1991 after she spoke up. You know, I think sometimes think she casts, you would know about this, cast a spell on Clarence Thomas that silenced him for those 28 <laughs> years. And um, because he basically, he's only spoke, he's really only spoken up once in this century and it was to defend the right of domestic violence abusers to have guns, interestingly enough. So, but and there's a way in which what happened with um, the Kavanaugh hearings were almost worse because it was, a, it was a more, it wasn't just harassment, it was a physical assault. There were, you know, and you could you could understand in 1991 why these men didn't get it. In 2018, the only reason they didn't get it is because it wasn't convenient and they didn't want to. It, you know, 1991, I remember I actually had a great weird experience arguing with handsome bikers in a Denny's on the road uh, north on I-5 from LA and actually I, I convinced them that Anita Hill was telling the truth. It, it was an early victory for me mm -hmm. and stuff. But people didn't, you know, all this stuff was really new in 1991. People, you know, who had not been sexually harassed in the workplace, and I think a lot of people who had been harassed knew it happened to them. They might not even have a name for it. Feminists gave us the word sexual harassment in the 1970s when you don't have a name for something, it's very hard to do something about it. It's like not knowing what disease you have so you don't have a cure. And, um, you know, but the reality of this and how it impacts you and why was really new in 1991. It was old in 2018, so I feel like what happened was much worse. You ask a great question. How, without idealizing and entrenching anger, can we grant non-white and non-male people an equal right to feeling and expressing it? I loved that. Can you, you say more? Yeah, there's been a bunch of stuff suggesting that women's anger is this wonderful, magic, awesome power. And, and I think on the one hand, women have not been allowed to be angry. You're, you know, 
and it happens to me in my life. My, you know, I, I am a feminist. Because that does not mean my experience in life has been feminist, but quite the opposite at times. Many of them, like the first thirty years, for starters. But um, you know, we often treat women's right to express anger as liberation, and there is a liberation being free to express things and having equal access. That's a democracy of communication. But being angry is actually an experience that makes you physically and, ment and emotionally miserable. Usually you're shutting down in some way. We used to talk about seeing red. And there is a way in which you, you no longer are a perceptive, receptive person. You really don't know what, you know, often you don't know what's going on. As a chronic state, it can actually cause severe health problems and elevate, you know, things that bring on diabetes, hypertension, heart attacks, etc. It's not... I'm not pro-anger. And so I think that there's a question, do we need more women's anger? Do we need more, who do, you know, I think everyone should have the right to express it, is one point. I think as another thing is, I think we need less white male anger because it's like, you know, it's an easy go-to fun thing for them to do and it's all treated like, oh, he's angry, there must be a really good reason for it. He's very manly and an action hero when he's anger, angry and stuff. And I think we should delegitimize, you know, some of that rage. But I also think, finally, that we call a lot of different things by the same name. And, you know, the book before this was called Call Them By Their True Names. I think language, I'm with Orwell on this, language is really important. Mm -hmm. I think there's a kind of righteous indignation where it's like, how dare you do that to those refugee children? which is not like, I want to punch you in the face, I'm full of personal rage, I want to harm things. It's actually the opposite. It's like, I don't want those children to be harmed. I want to protect them. I want to dismantle whatever harms them and stuff. So there's indignation, there's outrage, where like that's completely unacceptable. You know, there's like the sort of short-term rage, which is like, oh my God, you just hit my Mercedes and now I'm going to yell at you until I collect your insurance information. Not my Mercedes, you know, the theoretical Mercedes. And um, my Prius C is less exciting. And, um, you know, and then there's this kind of like, I am here to solve the problem of these people. I'm here to free the slaves. I'm here to get women the vote. I'm here to stop police from shooting black men. I'm here to get women equal pay. I'm here to prevent, you know, to stop. Uh, discrimination against trans people. And that can be a kind of fire that drives people, but they're not angry at anyone. So we call all these kind of things that I think can be a life purpose and dedication, a kind of defensive protective reaction, which is really kind of a form of love, you know, and your adrenaline glands going volcanic, all by the same name, and it doesn't help. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. <clears throat> so being more specific, uh, <laughs> helpful. I want to ask you about this, uh, your new memoir, which yes. is out in March, which is called Recollections of My Non-Existence. And you were very kindly earlier telling me about this image of you that's on the cover, which is such a great image. Yeah, no, the pho it's a photograph of me at 19 when I was very, very thin and very, very poor. I wow. kind of made my own way. And I just moved into my first good apartment. It was $200 a month in a black neighborhood. Wonderful black building manager invited me, to, made it possible for me to move in. And that was my home for 25 years, the home in which I became a writer. It's a, but it's really, it's about voices and voicelessness, really. And it's about the kind of experiences of violence against women I've so often written about in much more objective and impersonal ways, citing statistics, looking at social tendencies, et cetera. My own experience of, ex of constant sexual harassment and threat as a young woman, which was so intense that I had a few years where I really kind of had pretty intense PTSD uh, behavior. But it's also about what were those circumstances where a man where you couldn't say no because, you know, that deep voicelessness, you couldn't say, you can't do that to me. You couldn't say, um, you know, don't, you know, like, no, I'm not interested. Like if, I, we, everyone who's female here knows if you say no, sometimes you say no to those guys and they only get angrier. So I had these experiences of deep voicelessness where my words did nothing 
first of all, in telling, like they couldn't set any boundaries, couldn't create the space for me to choose what did and didn't happen to me. And then often afterwards, people couldn't hear me, didn't believe me, etc. So there's another kind of voicelessness. So it's really, a, and really the feminism I've been doing for the last dozen years, since I wrote Men Explain Things, you know, really for the last 35 years, I published my first feminist essay in 1985. You're looking at that and it's like, yes, and I was only a bold theory some people had <laughs> that would happen several years hence. But, um, you know, is that I, th I thought, but, but with the recent stuff, I was writing about violence against women and I realized I was really writing about voicelessness. What happens when no one believes you? What happens when your voice, which isn't just the ability to make sounds, but it's the ability to use your voice to establish you know, your path to assert your will, to set your boundaries, to bear witness. You know, your voice is your humanity, your power, your membership in a society. And if you don't have it, and it happens as much, you know, I just read Chanel Miller's amazing memoir. She's the woman who's raped by the Stanford, or sexually assaulted by the Stanford swimmer. And, um, you know, who was anonymous all those years. But she talks about the way that afterwards, the whole medical legal procedure was like a whole other round of being degraded, discredited, devalued, treated as not a competent witness to her own life. So I really wanted to talk about those questions about voice and talk about becoming a writer while having all those ordin extremely ordinary experiences young women do. You know, this very specific quest to have a particular kind of voice that means writing books as well as having the ordinary voice people have in conversation to say no that didn't happen you're not going to gaslight me on that mm -hmm. so and to also and to struggle for other people you know to become a voice in defense of other people's voices right. so you know i haven't had to t this is literally the first time i've talked in anything vaguely resembling public about it so you can see i'm still figuring out how to talk about it at, uh, it's lovely, as you were saying, you've done so many of these smaller essay books. I'm excited to read something of yours that is yeah. um, more autobiographical, autobiographical. What I do love, though, about your essays is that they are often so generously personal as well Thank as you. commentaries on all sorts of different issues. Just to continue with what you were saying, though, I'm curious about what happens when we put the word sexual in front of violence or in front of harassment, because it somehow seems to make it uh, more debatable or less serious. I've been watching all sorts of men respond to accusations of sexual violence and sexual harassment by saying, oh, well, that never would have happened because I didn't fancy her, or there's something about actually removing those words and it's just, sexual violence is just violence and her and I sexual it is harassment complicated is though because often something consensual becomes non-consensual something non-violent becomes violent i want to just before we you know i don't know how much time we've got i want to make sure that i fit this in but as someone who's played a princess in a fairy tale i loved that you rewrote um cinderella uh you call it cinderella liberator mm -hmm. um which is such an amazing title I read in the afterword uh, about the personal history of your grandmothers. Yeah. Um, and were they inspiration for this? Not version? directly. The actual inspiration for it is not two generations back, but two generations forward. I am the great aunt of the most magnificently feisty young person named Ella. And But it really began with... Um, you know, I found a Cinderella illustration that I thought was wonderful, and I turned it over and it had this very short text on it from one telling of the fairy tale where the fairy godmother says, what shall we do for a coachman? And Cinderella says, I will get the rat trap. And it's so great because what, and I, it was, you know, an epiphany. I thought, first of all, Cinderella is an active collaborator in all this transformation. She's not just the lucky one the fairy godmother came down and, you know, did everything for. You know, secondly, they're trans. This, and then I thought, because we're always told, I think the most conventional version of Cinderella is it's about getting your prince. Mm -hmm. And it's, I, just those two sentences, two or three sentences, I thought, 
No, this is a story about becoming, about, about transformation. And the fairy godmother is an agent of transformation, but so is Cinderella. And then I was like, well, how is this, you know, if you foreground that, all these things becoming other things, mm. what happens if you make it? And, you know, I'm not, I'm not a huge princess fan. I'm not sure how you feel about princesses having played very one or two. Feelings. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Although you play feelings. them very nicely. Thank you. I, I actually I've took a great, a great niece to that movie. And, um, Thank you. And, um, Thank you. You know, but uh, so I really was like, what's Cinderella for our time? And it's like, what does it look like? To, I mean, what is a point of transformation? It's liberation. What does liberation look like for this girl who's unvalued and exploited and overworked? And it was also very fun to realize that the name Cinderella contains the name Ella, Ella, you know, Cinder Ella. So I've written a book for Ella. Her younger sister is getting the next one, which is going to be a Sleeping Beauty rewrite. Oh, amazing. So, I was going to yeah, ask you Yeah, because also more. Arthur um, uh, Ransom, Rackham did fantastic silhouette images for those too. Yeah. And I have to, can I just hold it up? Yes. I love it so much. Will I burn my yes. sleeve off with these genuine candles? And one of the things, I, I love these silhouette illustrations so much because it felt like they're sort of less racially determined that you know a, a kid from Iran or Brazil could look at these and they could feel like this could be me this could be my story too and they're also just incredibly beautiful so, yes, and out of copyright because they gorgeous. turned 100 this year so, yeah. I yeah. love I love the her happy ending is that she becomes the truest version of herself that, that feels isn't that everyone's happy ending? It's often not the ending that's told, but yes. Yes. No, um, I'm curious to ask the truest version of yourself, but that's going too far. Should I just ask? <laughs> <laughs> the truest version of myself? Gosh, I mean... Well, to be continued in later years over other beverages. Yes, to yes, be continued. Yes. To be continued. I did want to ask you about Little Women. You have a movie coming out, do you not? I do have, I do have a movie coming out, and it is... Um, because it's also, it's a bit like Cinderella Liberator in that it's a, a feminist retelling of a classic. Yes, What's it is. Um, Louisa May Alcott, uh, what I love about Greta's retelling of this story yeah. is that she addresses what is often very controversial about Little Women, which is that a lot of readers, a lot of big fans of Louisa feel that she was forced by her publisher to write an ending that was not the ending for the story that she actually really wanted for it. Mm -hmm. And Greta's handling of that, whereby, I don't want to ruin it, but Greta's handling of that and the way that she uses her, her script to play out almost three different endings for the story so that the audience gets to see what it would look like in multiple different oh, versions yeah. and you don't really know which one is the real the version that she chooses for this story I remember finishing the script and just putting it down and going that's genius it's so yeah. clever what she does yeah. and uh, so I'm very proud I'm very proud to be part of a retelling of the story that I hope if Louisa can hear us um, is is an honoring of maybe part of it that she maybe didn't get to say or didn't get to tell. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's it's beautiful and uh, yeah. Thank you for asking me about it. Um, I saw the trailer and I'm trying to figure out which girls. There's a lot of girls from two to seventeen yeah. or eighteen in my life. Which ones I'm going to round up to go yes. see it? Yeah. So. I mean, I love the trailer. I mean, a very similar to really what you addressed yeah. in Cinderella Liberator is that is the is all the publisher seems to care about is well which of the guys does she choose you know that's really yeah. the ultimate thing that we yeah. want to know is which which man does she end up with um, and Sasha's response to that in the trailer is Joe is is so is so brilliant which is just kind of this oh my goodness how am I going to stomach the patience for for dealing with <laughs> dealing with all of this uh, I didn't realize how long I felt like I'd been waiting in a story, or in this specific story, to, to hear the stepsisters apologize and reconcile with Cinderella. It's secretly kind of a Buddhist Cinderella too. I was wondering about that. Yeah. I was reading it and I was yeah. like, I smell it. I, I also I felt like the stepsisters, I hate when the sisters are portrayed as funny looking as though like 
we don't only have to like pretty people and mm. pretty good people are pretty and pretty people are good and everyone else can go to hell <laughs> and uh, so we like we changed it yeah but I but I also was like you know and it was really interesting it's kind of a problem like how do you take this setup and it sounds a little bit like Retta's done with Little Women how do you take this setup and take it someplace else than the usual yeah. You know, the, the you know, Cinderella gets her man, everyone else gets punished, etc. Yeah. You know, and clearly the stepmother is a Buddhist hungry ghost. And, um, you know, but I also identified her as like the voice we all hear in our own heads. That like, I, like, I can't give you anything because I need more. It's mine. This is all about me. Yeah. And, um, you yeah. know, where's the stepsisters, you know, go off and do their glamour, glitter thing. So... Yeah. Yeah. There's one thing I also just while waiting, I wanted to share that Rebecca bought for me as a gift that I was so moved by, which is that she's been working on. Oh, I'm losing my mic. She's been working on a map, a tube map of New York, but all of the names on it are named after famous women instead of famous men, and it's it's profound. The minute I looked at it, I Im immediately teared up. And you told me Do you know why? Because that's such a... That... Do I know why I teared yeah. up? Because it's not something that I, I, I get to encounter in our culture and our society. I don't get to see women being celebrated in the same way. We, we sh well, you no. called it a tube map because you were a Londoner before I you know, were in New York. I know, it's a subway map. But let's, we should do London. Oh, please, can we do London? <gasps> Amazing! Wow, that just happened. I have a cartographer and a designer. We just have to come up with the names of... How many tube stops are there on the underground? About three... There, there uh, at are... least that many, probably. Well, you know which, what? Which Maybe not. Which this tube is... stop do you see yourself as, Emma? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> wow. I grew up in are Islington, you now so... Uh, where? Islington. Oh, so, there you go. We yeah, that, that would that would be very meaningful to me. But you, but, but you to talk, yeah. You cited these two beautiful quotes that two other women who had similar reactions to the reaction that I had when I looked at this map said. Can you please repeat them? Because yeah, I was so, yeah. The City of Women map was part of my 2016 New York City Atlas, but it's kind of a breakout map. We, you know, it's like the singer that's gone solo. We're uh, <laughs> distributing it separately. Because it just has resonated with people, and it was so exciting for me to do. One of the things that's shocking is I, I have lived my whole life in a manscape. I grew up in a town named after a man, in a county named after a man, you know, on a continent named after a man, you know, and almost all places are named after men, whether it's mountains, rivers, buildings, bridges. Cities, states, we have some exceptions. We have a couple English queens in Maryland and Virginia and a few other things, but it's really a male world. And I think that tells little boys, you can grow, like, it's, it's like the fact that most monuments in, in New York City, until very recently, had only five statues of historic women, you know, and hundreds upon hundreds of men. And so there's nothing for girls that said, like, you can be, you know, a general, a hero, uh, uh, you know, et cetera. And it really, I think it's one of the infinite things that aggrandized men and withered away the space for women to be. But so I taught at Columbia when this map was coming out, and I did a field trip with some students around New York. I showed them the map, and I said, how would your life be different if you, and these were mostly not white people either, how would your life be different if you lived in a city named after people like you, where everything was named after people like you. And these two young women said the most amazing things to me. One of them said, I have, you know, I have slumped over all my life. I would stand up straight in a city named after people like me. And the other one just said, would a man dare sexually harass me on a street named after a great woman? Mm -hmm. And it was really, they were so smart and so right and just the subtlety of how this changes our conduct to be in spaces that aggrandize us or not. And Harlem named a bunch of streets after black people, but they're all male. They're, you know, the great Harriet Tubman statue at the north end of Central Park. But there's still, we still live in a manscape. And it was really changing that was so exhilarating for me. We did a new version that's got Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and some other people mm -hmm. added. And I don't see why we shouldn't do a London one. I think it would be really fun. I 
<laughs> love that. Okay, okay. You're, if you're ready to become a printer and distributor, we're ready to go to. <laughs> I, okay. For sure, okay. I will figure okay. it out, undoubtedly. Yes, see, this, this is known as the famous conversation in which I cornered Emma and made her commit to print projects. A London G map. Or, or this will be the fairy tale in which I turned her into a tube stop. <laughs> I feel very... I'm not a tube stop, I'm a human being. <laughs> I feel very uncoerced. Um, very uncoerced. Um, thank you so much for all of your work. Thank you. I, uh, I say this at the end of the letter that I write for my book club, but we all have all different sorts of mothers and you have intellectually, politically, spiritually, in, in all sorts of ways, and my understanding have been a mother to me. So I'm very, very grateful to you, and thank you. I think of myself more often as an aunt, but that is the loveliest thing <laughs> anybody said it well, Good. That, that sort of nonlinear nurture of it, but thank you so much. Wow. Pleasure. Thank you. I would be and proud thank you to, to everyone be who came. another mother. Aww. I'm sure you have met, yeah, I know you have an actual one and many others. Yes, I do. I have many, I have many, and a wonderful mother. I'm very thank lucky. You. Very lucky. Thank you, and thank you all. Thank you. Thank you for coming.